Hello. In this video, we are going to look into a sample use case of building an event-driven application with Flink. As a reminder, in one of our previous videos, we have discussed how a lot of event-driven applications are built using transactional databases. Using a database naturally allows to push the concern of state fault tolerance from the application domain to the database domain. On one hand, with such approach, you have less to worry about in your application. Hopefully there's some sort of a database fault tolerance mechanism already in place. This could be, for instance, a master-master synchronous replication. In such case, you don't need to worry about losing your state even if an availability zone goes down. On the other hand, there are some drawbacks. Your state access is slow because each request has to go over the network. Databases are hard to scale. If you must process large volumes of data, you're likely to hit a bottleneck there. Moreover, synchronous replication solutions are usually expensive. So in this video, we will discuss how you can avoid those downsides by implementing an event-driven application with Flink. Instead of synchronous database replication for fault tolerance, it will instead rely on Flink's efficient snapshots mechanism, which we have discussed in the previous videos. So what kind of an event-driven application are we going to build? Let's imagine that for some mysterious reasons, we've decided that the world needs a new dating application. We come up with a fancy logo and a catchy name and we're ready to get started. So what exactly will Flink do in our application? Being all enthusiastic about Flink, we decide to put it right into the center of our most critical application logic, producing matches between our users. Let's say that we have a stream of like events. These events represent the fact that user1 likes user2. Likes are always directed, going from user1 to user2. Obviously, those likes can happen at any moment in time. If we receive two like events with the same user IDs, but the opposite order of user1 and user2, we want Flink to produce a corresponding match event. Flink is a distributed system, which runs your application on a distributed fleet of machines. Obviously, in order to produce a match, we first need to bring two related events together into the same physical server. In order to do that, we will define the getID method of the like class as follows. An ID of a like is a string containing sorted and concatenated IDs of the two users. That way, both the fact that user 101 likes user 305 and the fact that user 305 likes user 101 get the same ID 101 underscore 305. This example assumes that duplicate events are handled elsewhere in the system. So no duplicate events with the same user 1 and user 2 fields can arrive. If it is the second event, it must be alike in a different direction. It is actually not hard to also add this deduplication functionality with Flink, but we're going to skip it here for the sake of simplicity. So what are the next steps? We go ahead and define the structure of our Flink program. We define our data source. In this case, we consume like events from Kafka. Next, we do some transformations. We take the data stream of like events and apply the key by operation to it. As you can see, we pass a lambda function that uses the IDs of the like events defined previously to determine the key. Next, we tell Flink that our custom match function has to be applied to the partitioned or keyed data stream. At the end, we are sending the output of the match function to one or multiple sinks. We will go into the details of the match function implementation in a moment, but let's first take a look at what is the role of the key by function and also better understand why we define the IDs of the like events the way we did. Let's say we have two Kafka partitions and our Kafka consumer runs with a parallelism of two. Our match function at the same time is configured with a parallelism of three. The parallel instances of both the Kafka consumer and the match function can be deployed on completely different physical nodes. The first event arrives into our message broker. 
it indicates that user 101 likes user 305. It gets consumed by Flink. Because we instructed Flink to use the ID as the key, it is retrieved from each message. A hash function is calculated using it as the input. The space of all possible hash values is divided among the parallel instances of the subsequent match function. So each of them becomes responsible for processing a subset of those keys. In this case, the hash function produces the value which falls into the range of the third instance. The like event is then dispatched accordingly. After that, the next event arrives. The hash of its key determines another destination. Next, the third event arrives. This time, it is an indication that, the, that user 305 likes user 101. This one is important because it represents a match. We need to make sure that when we process it, we have access to the same state which previously indicated a like event in the opposite direction. Although this event arrives through a different Kafka partition, the same exact logic applies as with the first like. The idea of this event is the same as of the first event. The hash function produces the same result and this way both related events will be processed sequentially at the same host with the access to the same state within our match function. Now it is time to see what to actually do in the match function. As I already mentioned, match function is applied to a partitioned keyed stream. Hence, it is an instance of a keyed process function. Essentially, this means that all the state with, will be scoped to a particular key. The function has the following signature. String is the type of the key. The input elements are of type like, and we produce match events to the output. Inside of this process function, we get access to Flink's state abstractions. Managed fault tolerant state that is guaranteed to be recovered correctly in case of components failures. In order to tell Flink that the variable called liked must be managed by the framework, we first register it with the framework using the get state call and providing a state type descriptor. In this case, we use a Boolean type, but it could be any custom object type, ideally a podjo for efficient serialization and deserialization. One important thing to notice is something that is a frequent source of misunderstandings among the new users of Flink. Whenever you access Flink managed state from within a keyed process function, the value that you receive is automatically scoped to the key of the element that you are currently processing. So if the key of the incoming event is key underscore two, you will get the value that was previously stored under this exact key. The first line with null in the table is virtual, just to demonstrate the value that you will get when looking up by this key for the first time. Objects are only stored when they are explicitly put into state. So now back to the logic of our example. What do we need to do when we get a new like event? We first need to access the state to check if a like event with the same ID was previously observed. If it was, it must be a match. In this case, we clear the state and produce a match event. If this is the first like with this ID, we simply store this fact in the state. Now, in the majority of the cases, there's actually never going to be a matching like. Because of that, we would naturally like to clean the state after some time to prevent accumulation of too much stale data. For this, process function has the onTimer method. Here, we simply define what to do when the timer in the future is triggered. In our case, it is pretty simple. We just remove the entry with this particular key from the state. 
In order to register the timer, all we need to do is to add one more line to our implementation. This line indicates that a timer for the key of the current event should fire after a certain expiration timeout. It is important to notice that timers are handled by Flink in almost the same way as the rest of the managed state. Timers are fault tolerant and are also stored in Flink's state snapshots. This again means that you do not need to use an external service backed by a database such as Quartz framework. All your state is consistent in one place within Flink. Now let us look back at what we achieved. We implemented a stateful fault tolerant application without using a database. This system is horizontally scalable. If tomorrow Flinder becomes a huge success, we just need to add more machines. We also do not need to necessarily involve database or system administrators to scale our application. It can be handled by the developers by simply increasing the parallelism. The application that we implemented is a parallel execution system, but it is not subject to risks of introducing concurrency bugs. Process function methods are executed in a single thread, and correct and consistent access to the state is handled by the framework. We didn't have to think about executor services, synchronized blocks, and atomic variables. And the best part is that, apart from some wiring, this is all the code that we had to write. I hope this video gave you a feeling of how much heavy lifting Flink can do for you if you decide to use it for implementing your next data intensive application. Stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this series.